The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Good afternoon and welcome to our ninth INS lecture for this academic year. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm John Jackson and I will serve as the coordinator for today. Admiral Chatfield is on leave and can't join us, but I'd like to welcome you on her behalf. We've enjoyed bringing you this series as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. It has been expanded to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family, including members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport, and participants from around the nation. Looking ahead, please join us on 22 February 2022, when Rear Admiral Peg Klein will speak about ethical leadership. Okay, on with the main event. During the presentation that follows, please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature of Zoom, and we will get to as many of these as we can at the conclusion, conclusion of the presentation. December 2021 marked 10 years of Kim Jong-un's rule after his father's death. During the past de decade, Kim has consolidated his political power and ruled with an iron hand while growing North Korea's nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs. The North's econo economy continues to struggle and Kim has offered unusually candid assessments of the country's economic troubles. This very timely presentation will examine the current and future prospects of North Korean politics and economics, along with its nuclear program and possible US policy directions going forward. Terence Rorig is Professor of National Security Affairs at the US Naval War College and a non-resident expert with the Center for Korean Legal Studies at Columbia University. He was a research fellow at the Kennedy School at Harvard University and a past president of the Association of Korean Political Studies. Rorig has published numerous books, articles, and book chapters on Korea and East Asian security issues, North Korea's nuclear weapons program, Korean maritime security, deterrence theory, and the U.S.-South Korean alliance. He received his Ph.D. in political science from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Terry, the podium is yours, sir. Well, thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here and to have a chance to talk with you about these very important issues and ones that have become um, much more in focus over the last month, thanks to a whole series of missile tests. Uh, let me also offer the usual caveat that these are my own personal views only. So the United States has been rightly focused on strategic competition, great power rivalry, watching China and Russia. But this past month, North Korea reminded us all that North Korea remains an issue that we need to be concerned about and we need to be watching. It has also been a decade since Kim Jong-un has been in power and he has continued to grow his political position, but also grow the nuclear and missile capabilities of North Korea. And so while we continue our, our careful watch of China and Russia, North Korea remains a central element to continue to monitor in the years ahead. So today what I would like to do is start first with a few thoughts about where North Korea's economy is at, um, some about their politics, and then we'll turn to the nuclear weapons issues, and then also to talk about what are some of the potential policy directions going forward. So it has been 10 years now since Kim Jong-un has been in power, since he took over for 
his father after he passed in December of 2011. And this picture that we saw is the first glimpse, if you will, of Kim Jong-un uh, leading his father's funeral procession as um, his first sort of official duty, if you will. Over these next 10 years, Kim Jong-un, who started this journey as a 27, 28-year-old kid, a relatively young kid in the North Korean political hierarchy, purged a lot of the high-ranking military and party officials on his way to cementing his power, including his uncle, who is right behind him in this uh, procession. So even if you were a family member, it did not mean if you were a threat to his power that that could mean uh, dire consequences for you. Later, he also is going to have his half-brother killed in an airport in, in the airport in Kuala Lumpur. He will also uh, take on all of the important positions and duties that will be part of his consolidation of power. He's also going to revive the Communist Party in the political hierarchy in North Korea. And so you will see over the last couple of years, some of their important meetings taking place and policy decisions taking place during party meetings, as you see down below. And of course, he is going to make some major strides in these 10 years in North Korea's nuclear capabilities, as well as its ballistic missile capabilities as well. And if you look at the picture at the very top, um, he also succeeded in losing about 40 to 45 pounds, uh, which raised some interesting questions about his potential health situation, but he seems to be um, alive and well. So over the decade, he has been very clear in cementing his political position, and there are no obvious uh, sources of opposition to his rule. Of course, that's not necessarily good for your health if you decide to go that route, um, but his rule seems to be very stable and very secure at this particular point in time. So it looks like we are going to have a North Korean under Kim Jong-un for the foreseeable future. However, there are a couple of things that are in particular of concern that the regime is worried about and tops on their agenda list. And the first is the North Korean economy. The economy had already been struggling for a number of reasons, but the past two years have been particularly difficult for North Korea as three factors have come together at the same time to really slam the North Korean economy. And the first is the impact of the ratcheting up of economic sanctions after some of the later missile tests. And you see that reflected in this table of the North Korean GDP. 2016, uh, many surprised that there actually was some positive growth. But after 2016, the sanctions are really going to ratchet up in those next two years, in 2016 and 2017. And then you see that the North Korean economy is really going to start to slide. In addition to that, you also have the COVID lockdown. January of 2020, North Korea is going to be one of the first countries to completely lock down its country in response to the COVID outbreak. That's going to have particular economic circumstances because of the shutdown of trade across the Chinese border, both legal trade as well as illegal trade. And that is going to have a, a significant economic impact on China. Now, with the sanctions, there has always been a question about whether these sanctions have been enthusiastically enforced, particularly by China and Russia, but by others as well. The sanctions lockdown, or excuse me, the COVID lockdown has probably done more to enforce the sanctions than any of the actual sanctions uh, uh, measures. And so COVID has been probably one of the best sanctions enforcement mechanisms on the North Korean economy, but has had a significant impact. Then on top of that, North Korea has had two summers in a row of bad weather that has really nailed the harvest during that time period to the point where on top of that, 
In 2019, a UN report had declared that about 40% of the North Korean population was food insecure. Now you add to that the bad harvest from these past two summers. And these three things together have really caused havoc on the North Korean economy. And what has been interesting is Kim Jong-un's relatively unusual candor in acknowledging these facts. And as one example, this statement in a Workers' Party meeting notes that the economy and particularly agricultural production was getting tense. And he had made similar admissions at other points and, and at other meetings and unusually frank admissions about the difficulty of the economy. This is something that he is concerned about, um, but yet that has not um, prevented North Korea from devoting a good deal of its resources to military developments and such, but the economy is a concern. Another issue that has been an interesting element of concern to the regime and has clearly gotten the regime's attention, and that has been the inflow of information into North Korea over um, the last uh, number of years. One of the secrets of North Korea's stability has been its ability to be able to control the information flow that comes into the country, to be able to lock that down so that it doesn't have any competition for the government narrative, for government ideology that helps to support and legitimate the Kim family regime. But over the years, that has increasingly been challenged by information that has been able to get into the country through thumb drives, DVDs, SD cards that have been smuggled in, the ability to alter state um, manufactured radios and the stations that those are, are set to, and to be able to get some of those different competing sources of information in. The COVID lockdown has been an interesting element of this. As I've mentioned that this has been largely a health response as North Korea has been concerned that its health system, the nutritional system and immune systems of its people because of the economic difficulties. If the pandemic ever got a hold in North Korea, there would be really severe difficulties to that. So a lockdown for those reasons. But there also seems to clearly be a political motive to the lockdown. And that is that this lockdown has been able to shut down the flow of information into North Korea the illegal trade networks between China that brought in some of these different media sources has been able to, to be shut down by the, um, the regime. There is also with the lockdown, people are not able to travel and, and confined to their villages that allows for greater monitoring of the authorities as well. And so those kinds of things have been able to constrain that information flow. Also as an economic uh, side to this, there have also been over the years an increasing sort of marketization of the North Korean economy. And you have a number of savvy North Koreans who have been able to be fairly successful entrepreneurs in this kind of market activity that was going across the border to China legally or illegally. This was becoming a threat to the regime. And the, the uh, COVID lockdown was able we think was a gesture to be able to constrain some of that economic activity and control this group that may have been increasingly a concern to the regime's power and authority. So interesting elements there, but as, as another piece to this, the regime has also targeted this notion of ideological purity of cultural pollution that this trade and information flow has, has been a part of towards the youth of the country. And in particular, um, some of the inflows of South Korean music and dramas and such that have been part of that. And so in December of 2020, the regime also passed a new law that increased the punishments of the possession and trade of these kinds of, of information and, and media sources. 
These things were always illegal, but this law ratcheted up the punishments. It also increased the uh, surveillance of authorities and police on the border as well as internally. But it also cracked down on some of the corruption because if you got caught selling or possessing some of this media in the past, a bribe usually took care of it. That is also part of the crackdown associated with this law as well. And so the target is in particular South Korea, but also Japan and the US, because authorities were increasingly seeing South Korean music, South Korean dress, even South Korean slang in what the young people were saying, texting. And so that yes, there are cell phones in North Korea, um, about 3 million cell phone subscribers and great way to monitor what the population is um, um, saying and doing. And so very concerned about this inflow in particular of South Korean culture and language and such. And so a particular focus on the young. And so just yesterday, there was an article that appeared in the Workers' Party um, publication in North Korea that noted um, in particular that um, the new generation has not experienced war, i.e. the Korean War, and revolution, and that their ideological consciousness is not something that's hereditary and passed down. We have to make sure that that baton of ideology is passed down to the next generation. When you put all of this together, it is interesting that these actions demonstrate that this has gotten the regime's attention. And they are concerned about this and what the long range impact may be of some of this change and influx of outside information and something that, that bears watching. So with that, let us turn to the nuclear weapons piece to this. Um, it had been relatively quiet for a, a year or so, some testing, et cetera. But of course, that changed in January when North Korea tested a whole lot of different missiles and such. Um, North Korea had been showing off a lot of its different systems. As you see in some of the pictures here through parades, uh, they included a number of different new missile systems, but some of these have not necessarily been tested yet. So South Korea continues to improve and work on the growth of these capabilities. On the nuclear weapons side, North Korea has conducted six nuclear tests. The latest or the last one in September of 2017. That test had a relatively large yield, which there was some speculation in North Korea claimed that they had tested a hydrogen bomb, but many experts don't think it was quite that, that it may have been a boosted fission device. Estimates on what the size of the North Korean nuclear arsenal is range widely, but I think some of the better estimates are the numbers that I have up here that there is a guess that they may have 10 to 20 assembled warheads, but fissile material for another 40 to 50 warheads and projections that they are continuing to produce fissile material, perhaps at a rate of enough for six to 18 warheads per year going forward. But again, a lot of these are estimates as we really don't know for sure um, the size and capability of the North Korean arsenal. Their delivery system of choice are missile systems, and they have a lot of them and a number of different varieties of short, medium, intermediate range ballistic missiles, ICBMs, cruise missiles, and they are also working on a submarine launched ballistic missile as well. Most of these missiles, the land-based missiles, are um, mobile missiles, as you see um, in some of the pictures here below. They are largely liquid fuel missiles, but the North Koreans are working to transition those to solid fuel missiles because there's an important technological advantage to having solid fuel missiles. But this is another interesting demonstration or, or, or indication of what North Korea's future ambitions may be of some of these systems. In the Eighth Party Congress about a year ago, Kim Jong-un laid out in one of his statements a pretty extensive wish list 
of what he is directing the scientific community to continue working on. And that list included tactical rockets, intermediate range cruise missiles, different types of warheads, which raised an interesting question about whether he was going to develop a lot of different size warheads, in particular, smaller tactical nuclear weapons. And did that point to a direction that North Korea's nuclear strategy and doctrine may be much more of a war fighting doctrine as well as um, assured retaliation? Um, Kim also talked about hypersonic glide vehicles, guidance technology, excuse me, guidance technology for multiple warhead rockets. So does that mean North Korea is also going to move towards multiple independently launched reentry uh, warheads so that those um, missiles that you see there, the large nose cones, may actually have multiple warheads on them as opposed to just a single warhead on them. And lastly, talked about a nuclear-powered submarine. Um, the picture in the lower right there is one of the, the pictures that North Korea has released for some of their submarine development. They're working on a submarine launch ballistic missile. We know less about any um, nuclear-powered submarine. But this was an interesting and an ambitious wish list for North Korean capabilities, perhaps largely aspirational, but on the other hand, North Korea has been able to achieve a lot of progress in areas that we didn't think they were going to get to quite as quickly as they have. So again, these things deserve to be watched closely. Well, and then of course, we have January. Kim Jong-un a while back had talked about giving, or one of his officials had talked about, well, the United States, depending on its policy, would would determine what sort of Christmas president might get. Uh, well, this is about two years late, but uh, perhaps this is what was in mind um, a while back. I won't go through all of this, but you can see an array of different missile systems that were tested from the hypersonic glide vehicles to short range ballistic missiles um, to the eye catcher was the intermediate range missile that was the last one that was launched. Seven missile tests in one month. This broke a record even for Kim Jong-un, who, who has a strong record for testing a lot of stuff. But he got it all in before the Olympic Games because there was a great deal of speculation that he would not want to launch anything that upstaged the um, Olympics in Beijing and, and got Chinese anger. Um, but we shall see. What is interesting to note in the middle of all of this, Kim Jong-un had another party meeting where he dropped this line. And that was that he gave orders to his, his officials to reconsider restarting all temporarily suspended activities. A reference to a voluntary moratorium he had given during the Trump years to not test a nuclear weapon or a long range ballistic missile. This is the interesting sort of shoe that we watch to see if this is going to drop perhaps after the Olympics and is an ominous warning that, that we will be paying very close attention to, to see if this is the next event that may happen um, in the testing regime. So why did Kim do all of this testing in January and, and what was the motive for this? There has been a lot of speculation about what that may have, have entailed and a lot of different reasons. These are some of them that are up here and I'll talk about them in just a minute. They aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. And I think certainly there is a, a degree of, it's not certain which of these necessarily is the explanation. But a number of these, I think, point to some different elements of, of what you may see going on. And some of them may apply to some of the different tests, um, but not others. And so first of all, some of the testing may have simply been technical. If you're developing new capabilities, if you wanna know if it works, you've gotta test it. And then see what went wrong, test it again, and that may be part of it. Some have also suggested that this was an effort to get the United States attention, that it was a reminder that it was North Korea's effort to remind the United States and South Korea to 
demonstrate North Korean strength, that perhaps in the future, if negotiations happen, North Korea will, will be approaching this from a position of strength. There's also speculation that North Korea is trying to craft a, a, a sort of a position globally that it's a nuclear power. It's got defense capabilities like any other missile state. Well, of course, we have to test this, and this is normal activity uh, for us. Also, there is some element that this may be largely directed at a domestic audience, that given the economic struggles that North Korea has, that this is a sign to those in the military as well as to the general public in North Korea, we are still strong despite some of the other um, difficulties we are going through. And lastly, it may just simply be a statement to the United States and South Korea that we aren't interested in dialogue. And I'll talk about some of that in just a minute. Again, there could be any number of these that are part of the explanations for this. It's not entirely certain. I think there is some element of, of all of these in many respects that is at play. And, and again, these aren't necessarily exclusive. So with all of that on the table and looking forward, what do we do next? What comes um, in the future? And so you may recall 2018, 2019, we had all the summits that had happened between the United States and North Korea, United St uh, South Korea and North Korea and others. And there was some degree of hope that perhaps there could be some progress. But the last two, two and a half years, there has been very, very little contact at all between the different uh, parties. And so when the Biden administration came in, they announced that they were going to do a top to bottom review of U.S. policy towards North Korea. And in April of 2021, they announced that they had concluded that review. There was no sort of formal rollout of the policy and no formal document that was issued. But through press conference, uh, press conference and, and other um, events, the Biden policy essentially seems to have these general characteristics to it. And let me walk through a couple of these. First of all, they remain committed to the goal of denuclearization. Now, that's interesting in its own right, because you ask most North Korea analysts, they will tell you, denuclearization is not going to happen. If it does happen, it is a long, long process. But yet for political reasons, for non-proliferation policy reasons, that still remains the stated goal of the United States, of South Korea, Japan, um, and others. The uh, policy also talks about not focusing on a grand bargain or strategic patience. A grand bargain is a nod that they are not going to go at it like the Trump administration in the summit meetings and try to get some you know, major conclusion to this, that that's not feasible. But strategic patience is a reference to the Obama administration and that we're not going to sort of put this on the shelf. And so they're trying to craft something in between those two positions and argued that they're going to take a calibrated, practical approach and diplomacy is going to be the centerpiece of their policy. But until there is any progress, sanctions are going to remain in place. And we're also going to confer very closely with our allies, particularly South Korea and Japan, among others. The Biden administration has also been a bit tougher on North Korea in regards to human rights. And so the State Department issued a report that offered a pretty blunt and blistering criticism of North Korea's human rights record. And there, of course, is often debate when you look at policy about you've got the denuclearization issue on one hand and you've got human rights on the other. If you call out North Korea in, in a very uh, loud manner on human rights, you're probably not going to get much progress on denuclearization. But on the other hand, the human rights community says, how can you continue to ignore human rights when dealing with North Korea and their, their atrocious human rights record? The Biden, the Biden administration is trying to sort of split that difference, if you will. Um, 
the U.S. still remains committed to denu- or, excuse me to uh, diplomacy, and the line that you often see in in the press, and one that was first uttered by the special representative Sung Kim, who is the lead on North Korean negotiations, and that is that we are willing to sit down with the DPRK anywhere, anytime, without preconditions. And that preconditions piece is an important caveat because in the past, the U.S. position had always been, yes, we are always willing to talk to North Korea, but the starting point is denuclearization. This position is a bit of of a, of a concession, if you will, to that. But again, clearly denuclearization is the goal. The Biden administration has reached out to North Korea on a number of occasions over the last number of months, but North Korea has not been very responsive to that. And so the missile tests often put in that context or viewed in that context, is North Korea interested in any sort of dialogue? Um, How do the tests demonstrate what that may mean? Um, But the Biden administration continues to try. With all of that laid on the table, what might be some possible policy alternatives to uh, proceed in regards to North Korean policy? And first of all, let me say the denuclearization goal, I think, is the central one. Are you going to continue to hold any future policy to denuclearization? And if not, what is your goal then? And there are some important ramifications on that particular decision. Also, some of the proposals that are out there will will almost all have a starting point that the alliance has to be maintained and is an important element of security on the peninsula and making sure that there is a robust deterrence posture. There is generally agreement on that across the spectrum. With that said, I would categorize some of the future, uh, some of the proposals for U.S. policy along sort of three general lines. The first is that this is not the time to relax pressure. It is time to ratchet up pressure on North Korea, particularly given what we think we know about their economic situation. Increase sanctions. Don't draw them down as sort of an opening um, gesture to to North Korea. Um, There's an argument that with all these missile tests, North Korea has not paid much of a price for that. We've got to change that and begin to add some greater level of accountability to North Korea when they conduct these tests. But the question, of course, is what that is and what that looks like. We have had a a scaling back of joint exercises in South Korea over the years, in part as a political gesture for dialogue, but also because of COVID issues. But this side of the argument would argue, you know, we have seen enough of this. It's time to go back to a regular exercise regime, starting with this spring, and continue to press North Korea on the human rights issue. On the other side of the coin, are those who would argue, we've been doing this for the last 20, 30 years, and it hasn't gotten us anywhere. We need to try something different, something more proactive. And these folks would argue something that I would call as a a proactive engagement plan or, or policy. We've got to offer something up front to North Korea to demonstrate some sort of degree of good faith to the North Koreans that we and the South Koreans are willing to adjust what the North always calls our hostile policy, offer perhaps some opening sanctions relief proposal, something that can have a snapback provision perhaps if North Korea doesn't um, reciprocate. You may, if you follow Korean security issues, the last number of months, there has been a proposal on the table that has been pushed fairly hard by South Korea about having an end of war declaration. Something that wouldn't replace the armistice, but it would be a declaration by the United States, by South Korea, to indicate that the war is over, Uh, that we can move forward from that and that it would be a starting point to be able to move towards improving relations. 
economic engagement, and again, perhaps some sort of sanctions relief. Um, this is going to be a tough sell with the missile tests that we have had. But again, this is the other side of that argument to say, what's pressure gotten us and the current policy gotten us so far? We need to try something different. Somewhere in the middle and, and where I tend to come down is something that would look at this situation in sort of a different manner and, and acknowledge that denuclearization is highly unlikely ever, or at least certainly in the long term. And instead, this is going to be something that we have to look at as a problem that we manage rather than solve. And perhaps the starting point, even though we may still talk about denuclearization, the starting point is to consider this much more of an arms control problem or a, a threat reduction problem. And so therefore, see if we can't negotiate some sort of codification of the testing moratorium that North Korea had voluntarily put in place. And we might have to offer some sort of sanctions relief for that, but we treat this more as an arms control issue. Um, if we can get some sort of limitation on North Korean capabilities and numbers, conventional systems also could very easily be on the table as part of this. Now, certainly this is no easy answer either, and I have verification listed under that as another big challenge to this. But when you look at all of these different options and the North Korean problem in general, there are no easy answer th answers to this. There probably has never been any easy answers to this. But this is a third option that may be another way of approaching the North Korean challenge as opposed to these two um, on the other side of that. In the months ahead, there are going to be, as I move towards wrapping up here and, and moving to questions, I would like to, to throw out four events, if you will, to keep an eye on over the next number of months. First of all, South Korea is in the last stages of its campaign for its presidential election, which will be held on March 9th. The two candidates, Lee Jae-myung from the Democratic Party is on the liberal side, the progressive side of the party. He is likely, and he is the successor, if you will, of the uh, uh, current Moon Jae-in administration. He's likely to continue the pro-engagement position of the current South Korean government. But on the other side, Yoon suk yeol is the conservative People Power Party candidate. If he wins the election, then there's likely to see a change in South Korean policy towards the North. So far, he has a slight edge, but it's close enough that this is going to be really interesting as an election to watch. Then after the Olympics are done, is Kim Jong-un going to follow through on his implication that he is reconsidering his testing moratorium on nuclear weapons? and long-range ballistic missiles. If he crosses those lines, the United States and others will likely have a very different response than has been the case up to this point. The spring exercises are not far off. Typically in March um, and April, those are likely to go back to normal, if you will, and North Korea has typically responded negatively towards those exercises. We'll see what that response might be. And lastly, a good anniversary is another time to test something. And in uh, April, we have the 110th birthday celebration of Kim Il-sung, who is the first leader, the grandfather of Kim Jong-un, absolutely revered in the North Korean political hierarchy as the founder of the country. That would be a good time perhaps to test something and try to uh, um, have something to commemorate his um, birthday, if you will. So stay tuned and watch for those events. And so let me just wrap up before I turn it over to, to questions here that the North Korean challenge has not gotten any easier. And as the months go along, as the years go along, North Korea continues to increase its capabilities. And we need to watch that. We need to be concerned. Denuclearization is highly unlikely going forward. 
But I think there are reasons why that's likely to and probably should at least publicly remain the goal. But I think increasingly, and I've, I've said this in a number of different forums, we have to continue or we have to start to look much more at North Korea as a challenge to manage than a problem to solve. And that has a whole different sort of set of dynamics to it. And I think we have to start to shift in that direction. So let me stop there and open it up to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we have uh, 200 people uh, participating via Zoom here today. So I think that's a, a comment on the seriousness of the issue and the scholarship of our presenters. So uh, very glad to, uh, to see that happen. Are there questions here in the auditorium? Dean. So Terry, as usual, I learned a ton here and I have so many questions I want to ask. But the one question that struck me was when you put that uh, map up, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Chinese foreign policy towards North Korea and any changes that have occurred over time? Give us a good overview of South Korean policy towards North Korea as, and potential changes, U.S. changes in foreign policy. How has China's rise and is, has that changed or has it been relatively stable? Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting story because we often portray in, in the media that they're close allies. And there certainly is a relationship between the two and they have some common interests. But there's also some degree of, of lack of trust um, between the two sides. For example, I think North Korea is, is very nervous about the economic dependency they have on China. Um, although they really have no choice at, at this particular point, even with the lockdown, um, there are signs that economic exchanges starting to open up. There were reports last week of, of a train or two that may have crossed the border. Um, the Chinese are often looking sort of warily at the North Koreans as well, that, that um, we think the Chinese control the North Koreans, but that's really not the case at all, as the North Koreans are, are very willing to act independently. But when you go back to the testing that happened in 2016 and 2017 and the sanctions regime. I mean, you look at all the UN sanctions that were applied to North Korea. That required Chinese support in the UN Security Council. And I think China was very clearly unhappy with North Korean actions because China wants stability on the Korean Peninsula. They still want a divided Korea, but they want stability. And when North Korea stirs the pot with missile tests and, and all the things that happened in 2016 and 2017, I think Chinese anger was, was legitimate. But going forward, China has always sort of been a defender, if you will, of North Korea in a number of different ways, politically and such. And so most recently, you have seen China... Um, at try to get sanctions relief in the UN Security Council. The United States has gone to the Security Council in the wake of these January tests to try to get a, a statement of condemnation from the Security Council, an increase in sanctions, um, in addition to unilateral sanctions the US applied. And China and Russia have, have said no. So I think China will continue to defend um, North Korea in some of those different ways. So there is a relationship. I think they have certainly some interests in, in, in each other's continued um, development or, or, or the, the relationship, if you will. Um, but there's also some wariness on both sides, I think, in, in regards to this relationship as well. But certainly um, for the moment, North Korea is an important um, state that China wants to see the division remain. North Korea as a buffer state is crucial for Chinese foreign policy in the region and will continue to support that. Any other questions here in the auditorium? Gary, do you have some questions via uh, Zoom? 
Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, quite a few questions on, on Zoom. Uh, related to the relationship with China and South Korea and Japan, um, any hope for the six party talks to be resumed and how aligned are, are South Korea and Japan uh, in regards to um, approaching North Korea? Yeah, boy, that's a that's a complicated question and a, and a lot of pieces to that. Let me start with the Japan South Korea part to that. Japanese South Korean relations are in a tough spot, and for a lot of issues besides North Korea, um, and they go back to unresolved historical issues, etc. Um, on North Korea, they don't align entirely, as Japan is is has much more of a of a hard edge a position towards North Korea. The Moon administration is, has been much more pro-engagement in regards to the North Korean uh, position. If conservatives are elected in, if, if Yun wins the South Korean presidential election in March, then Japan and South Korea may be much more aligned there. I think there also may be an opening for improved South Korea-Japan relations with a new administration in the Blue House in Seoul, but there are still a lot of historical structural issues that are going to be part of that. The six-party talks, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, I think it is much more likely that it is going to be uh, bilateral at the start, perhaps trilateral with the US, South Korea and North Korea, um, or, or perhaps China. I think you know, there could be much more of a quad sort of, of arrangement there, but none of that has been sort of on the table for any recent period of time. So um, you know, in many respects, it's the United States and North Korea is, is an important starting point here, as well as inter-Korean relations. And we just haven't seen much progress on that front going forward. But again, you know, 2018, when Kim offered an olive branch in his New Year's address in January of 2018, that came as a surprise. Uh, perhaps there is something like that possible as well, but it's not, not very optimistic at this particular stage. Uh, another question uh, that came in is um, cons for uh, in regards to um, weapons development and um, and just the uh, that it's obvious that North Korea does not have um, the economy to develop or or potentially does not have the uh, resources to develop uh, weapons. Does China? then have a guiding hand in North Korea weaponry and its development? And um, is North Korea a weapons program uh, for testing Chinese weapons? Yeah, China, North Korea, you would be surprised how much of that capability has been developed indigenously over the years as their scientists have been able to, to make a lot of that progress. They have worked in the past with Iran um, a good bit, uh, and, and Pakistan on its nuclear program back in, in the day to get some of these things started. But a lot of it is, is done indigenously. Now, as far as resources go, that's the interesting question. So when you look at North Korea's economic problems, part of that is because their defense budget is estimated and again, emphasis on estimation here, that it could be as high as 25% of its GDP. And there was just a report that came out uh, last week that North Korea's cyber hacking has been able to um, get all sorts of resources and that they, those are likely being put into the, the weapons programs. So North Korea has been able to devote a good deal of weaponry, excuse me, a good deal of funding towards its, its weapons program. And the parades have been an interesting glimpse into those different capabilities. And not only on the nuclear and the missile side of things, but also some of these parades pointed to some of the improvements in small arms 
and other sorts of lower level systems as well. So North Korea, despite the economic trouble and, and the, uh, the price that its population pays for this, is devoting a good deal of, of the scarce resources, including the stolen digital currency, uh, towards its military capabilities. But again, a lot of that is indigenously developed, um, in particular, uh, some of the missile technology as well as other things. Uh, thank you. Um, a separate question. Um, uh, does South Korea and, and or Japan have in place operational missile defense systems uh, that um, perhaps Israel has? Yes, but there's an interesting difference here, and this gets back to China and, and differences South Korea and Japan have in regards to China. In 1998, North Korea tested its first medium-range ballistic missile that traveled over the Japanese homeland, and that really got Japan's attention. And that is, is the marker of when Japan goes all in on missile defense. Uh, not only developing its own indigenous missile defense capability, but working with the United States for a regional ballistic missile defense architecture, if you will. South Korea also has a ballistic missile defense capability. It's got PAC-3s. Um, it also has Aegis destroyers with um, ballistic missile defense capabilities. But South Korea has been careful to keep it as an independent capability and not work with the United States and certainly not work with Japan and the United States in sort of a regional um, configuration because of the fears of what the reaction from China would be. And of course, South Korea got a taste of what that was going to be when we deployed THAAD batteries to South Korea and the Chinese punished the South Korean economy several billion dollars of impact on the South Korean economy by restricting um, tourist groups to South Korea, punishing the South Korean corporations that had um, operations within um, China, in particular the Lotte Corporation who gave the golf course in South Korea, um, gave that land for the THAAD batteries. And so South Korea has been very concerned about angering China in regards to ballistic missile defense. Now, with that said, there are some interesting elements here as perhaps some changing dynamics within South Korea. There's interesting public opinion data in South Korea that is pointing to a slow deterioration and a majority of such of negative views on China, even more so that there is a more negative view of China than Japan. And given, given where South Korea and Japan relations are these days, that's saying a lot. Um, and so there's also a sense that, that China is increasingly a, a threat to South Korean security. But still, South Korea depends heavily on Chinese trade and investment. And so South Korea has been sort of walking this policy position that's often referred to as strategic ambiguity between the United States as its top security partner, <laughs> excuse me, on one hand, and China as its economic partner on the other. But there's increasing sentiment that perhaps South Korea needs to shift more in the direction of of away from, from China. I think perhaps the best way I have, I've heard this described by, by some South Korean analysts is, the United States will always be South Korea's number one security partner and close ally. But we still have to figure out a way to manage our relationship with China because they are still there in the neighborhood and are still central for South Korean economic prosperity. So that creates a very interesting dynamic that, that I think is part of the bigger picture that points to why missile defense, South Korea is a little more careful about keeping a separate sort of missile defense capability from Japan and the United States. 
Uh, Gary, let me pass the uh, final question. Uh, what is the range of the Korean weapons? Do they represent a threat to the continental United States? And this recent situation where airlines were grounded on the West Coast seemed to be in coordination with these Korean tests. Any comments about that? Yeah, that's, that's one of the interesting debates about North Korea's capability. They have certainly demonstrated the capability for short, medium range missiles, for certain um, intermediate range systems as well. The question is the ICBMs and the long range missiles. From some of the tests that they did in 2017, the missile community, I think, would, would suggest that there's a fairly um, strong consensus that those missiles can probably reach the United States, probably, or at least a fairly decent percentage. There still is some question, in, in my view, about the ability to put a nuclear warhead on top of those, that do they have the guidance systems to be able to um, get these to the right location? Do they have the reentry vehicles that are going to be much more challenging for that type of a long range ballistic missile to be able to actually get to the target, detonate when they are supposed to? Um, those kinds of issues are, are still, I think, some question marks. But the bottom line, North Korea continues to work on this capability and improve that even without some of the long range tests. And, and the question is, is there enough capability? to be able to possibly have a deterrent impact on the United States and its actions. And you may not need 190% confidence in a system to get that. 10, 15% may be enough for North Korea to get some degree of deterrent benefit from those systems. But the big question then is, if North Korea wants more confidence in those systems, is it going to have to test them? And then what's that going to mean for the security environment? And again, those are, are the, the, the difficult, ominous questions as we go forward. Thank you very much. Uh, terrific presentation. Uh, we thank you all for joining us.